When I was eight years old, I received my first Toa sets from the Bionicle line. I had so far only got the villain sets from previous years, and my Bionicle obsession was growing, but not yet total. This changed in 2004. I'm going to talk about the elements of the 2004 story arc, and why, as we look back at 20 years since the release of the Toa Metru, why this year of the story remains my personal favourite to this day. The setting of 2004's story arc takes us to a starkly contrasting location to the previous years, from the tribal society of Matanui, with its jungles and beaches, to the more overtly science fiction aesthetic of Matanui. Despite the advanced technology, in terms of chronology, we're actually going back in time. The Bionicle Adventures series of books are presented through a narrative framed by Turaga Vakama recounting his memories of the city to the Toanuva, who listen in wide-eyed wonder to the stories of a legendary city of old with advanced technology hitherto unknown to both the characters and the audience. Almost like Legends of El Dorado as told among the Spanish during the 16th century of our real world history, Machinui is a place with airships, guttering towers and the chute system which served kind of like aqueducts in our world, or a transport system such as an inner city train. Further to that, given Machinui serves as the brain of Matanui, the chute network could be interpreted as synapses and nerves of the Great Spirit. Machinui is a rich setting, bustling with activity, and most appealingly to me, and something I will go in more depth on later, intrigue. The six districts of Machinui converge into one central point marked by the iconic Colosseum, which acts as the core of the city and supposedly belongs to all the inhabitants of the city. Even within just this one structure are multiple levels, chambers and prisons that see some of the most crucial decisions taken, with it acting as the seat of power of the Turaga of Machinui. Garmetru is the peaceful, scholarly district of Metronui with plentiful access to water and natural features. Most importantly, perhaps, it is home to the Great Temple, built to venerate the Great Spirit and incredibly sacred to Toa especially, for it is here where Lee Khan recovers the Toa Stones and later where Six Matoran would use them to become the Toa Metru. Ta Metru is the industrial sector of Metronui, with the Great Furnace lying at its heart, and it is in these fires and forges where Kanoka discs are created which in turn are made to create Kanohi masks. Lee Metru perhaps epitomises the technological advancement of Metronui more than any other district. Here is where the shoot system is maintained and new inventions are tested. The arteries of the city that are overseen by the Matoran here snake and wind their way through the rest of the metropolis, transporting goods and cargo to other districts. Supplies are used for construction of sculptures and buildings in Po Metru, which appears like a quarry as Ta Metru does to a metal works marked by canyons and dusty plains, where the Pomatoran toil away to construct the infrastructure of the entire city. The workers who call this district home are Mechinui's backbone. Ko Mechu's answer to Ta Mechu's furnaces, or Li Mechu's shoot towers, are its knowledge towers. Dazzling crystalline structures, which in marked contrast to the rest of the city, come to be through organic processes. Grown from a single crystal exposed to liquid protodermis, these structures are where the Komatoran observe the stars in an attempt to better understand their future. Much like the climate of this district, the Komatoran appear cold and seem distant to hear the Matoran, with many choosing not to speak in order to better focus on their work. And lastly is Onometru, almost a hybrid of Pometru and Komatru, for not only are important things invented and built here, but is home to the Great Archives, a subterranean museum where nearly every species of Rahi known to the Matoran is stored, observed and studied. The Archives are pretty much another city of their own, existing right underneath the rest of Machinui. With hundreds of levels, sub-levels and maintenance shafts, countless surprises and mysteries call these tunnels home and await discovery. This, I feel, adds so much richness to Machinui, as well as its sense of mystery. As a result, the setting really comes across as being lived in and even has a cyberpunk-esque aesthetic to some parts of it. As I'll expand upon when we come to the story of 2004, we have mechanical law enforcement drones patrolling the streets, dark hunters on covert missions standing on shadowy alleys, all to create a well-realised setting. In addition to the features of each district, Machinui, despite being a city, is home to many species of Rahi and has an ecosystem that coexists with the machinery and processes of the Matoran civilization. 
Let's start with Gar Metru and take a look at some Rahi that can be found here. First are Doom Vipers, first found aboard a cargo hold of a ship docked in the Gar Metru harbour. After killing the entire crew, they made their way to the centre of the district. If the name didn't suggest it enough, these creatures had an extremely aggressive temperament and used their toxic breath to kill plant life and other Rahi. Elsewhere in the district, down in the dark waters underneath the Great Temple, lurked a Rahi so enormous that when Nokama accidentally found herself in its mouth, she thought she was in a cave and its teeth were speedy of them. The full extent of its size seems to be unknown. It is said that the jaws were capable of swallowing the entirety of the Great Temple if it so wished, though whether this is the product of Matoran Tall Tales is unclear. Known only as the Dweller in the Deep, this creature, ostensibly the only one of its kind, preys on Terracava and most commonly, Great Temple Squid. Scuttling between vents could be found furnace salamanders. Inhabiting the nooks and crannies of the furnaces and foundries of Tarmetru, they thrived off being around sources of great heat and were known to possess a bite which, as one Matoran is quoted, like a thousand hot needles. Soaring the skies and leaping from the lofty heights of Lee Metru with a phase dragon, often found chasing the airships, these Rahi had the ability to shift to an intangible state from which their name is derived. Below, clinging to the cables overlooking the city, could be found the cable crawlers. Considered a pest due to their tendency to cut through the power cables, their Ratuka power is especially dangerous given its environment, distorting the balance of and causing vertigo within its target. They often nested in the cargo holds of airships, causing further damage as they chewed through supplies of shipments being transported to other parts of the city. Scaling the knowledge towers of Kometru were the crystal climbers. While they often preyed on the ice bats, which were considered pests by the native Matoran, their presence was not approved of. Their sharp claws allowed them to cling to the icy surfaces of the knowledge towers. While herds of stampeding Kikanalo would often cause great damage to the assemblers' villages of Pometru, their presence was largely welcomed by the Po Matoran, as the resulting lumps of protodermis churned up from the earth was useful for the sculptors. As Kikanalo age, their tusks turn yellow, and their hide begins to bear strange markings. And that's not even scratching the surface of all the Rahi that live within Metronui. Testament to the incredible world building on display in this year of the story. The story of 2004 has an element of intrigue to it that I find just enthralling. The first book of the Bionicle Adventures is even called The Mystery of Metronui, and follows the novice tour Metro searching for six Matoran, and then the great discs needed to defeat the Morbizak plant. This storyline hasn't always seemed to be the most popular or talked about among fans, but I think the Morbizak, being an organic foe, represents an interesting contrast to the highly urban setting. It feels like a legacy of the very early enemies we got in 2001 with the infected Rahi, and to an extent the Bowrock, a force of nature that could inflict untold damage if left unchecked, and poses an existential threat to the Sorin way of life. The sound grew louder and seemed to multiply. Kapura felt the urge to run, but his feet would not move. He forced himself to turn around and look. Four thick, black and twisted vines were snaking their way out of cracks in the ground, waving in the air as if momentarily unsure of what to do. Then they wrapped themselves around the empty factory and began to climb, winding around again and again until they covered the building from top to bottom. The images of the Morbizak vines twisting themselves around buildings and encroaching into the residences of the Matoran feels reminiscent of something out of John Wyndham's Day of the Triffids. Any story that touches on when nature and civilization clash, and in the wider context of the Bionicle story, a villainous plant of all things, isn't something we get very often. The other notable example is of course the Kazani plant, which, much like its namesake, proved too unpredictable for Makuta to exploit successfully, and was abandoned in favour of the Morbizak. In order for the Toa Metru to defeat the King Root, which had embedded itself at the heart of the Great Furnace, they needed to find the six great discs scattered throughout each of the Metru districts. This wasn't so much to ingratiate themselves with Taragaduma like the film suggests, but I will touch on that when we get to the associated media chapter. Now what makes this storyline interesting to me is that the roles we would normally associate with certain types of character are turned on their head. We have Matorin who are deceitful, and Tower who are out of their depth. The Tower are unprepared in their roles, not having the opportunity to be trained beforehand like the Toa Mata, and have to find their power on their own, as the title of Book 2 suggests, Trial by Fire. The Matoran who know the locations of the Great Discs, as shared to the Karma through a vision, are betrayed by one of their own, revealing an interesting side to the Matoran, which can just as easily be corrupted as any Toa. 
Akmu's resentment of his Pelmatoran rival Onewa is exploited by Nadiki, one of the three Dark Hunters sent to Metrinui, and leads his fellow Matoran into traps in order to acquire the discs before the new tower do. When the other Matorans subsequently go missing, the Toe Metro must track them down and rescue them to recover the great discs. This race through the city takes us to some locations in Metronui that allows us to get more of a glimpse of some of the places mentioned in the setting. Their search is complicated by Vaki and the Dark Hunter Nadiki who attempt to stop the Tower Metru. Wanua's search takes us into the archives, which he explores with Nuju in order to locate the Ono Metru Great Disc. This gives us an insight into the relationship between the two characters, who are both researchers and scholars by trade, though their fields of study are very different. We see this play out in Nuju's assessment of the archives, a museum, i.e. a place focused on the past, in contrast to Nuju's discipline of understanding the future. To and Nuju scowled as they walked through the latest in a series of seemingly endless hallways filled with dusty display cases. Before he became a Toa, Nuju's job had been scanning the sky searching for hints of what the future held for Metronui. To him, the archives were nothing but a monument to a dead past. I never knew this place was so big. He muttered. As big as it needs to be, replied Wenua, pride in his voice. We've added two new sublevels lately. The subterranean sections will someday stretch to the sea in every direction. Why stop there? Why not just knock down the rest of the metro and turn the whole city into a dusty museum? Wenua glanced at Nuju with irritation. That might be better than wasting time and space trying to predict a tomorrow that might never come. The pair stumble across many strange and dangerous Rahi which have never seen the light of day as they search the archives. I'll leave a link to my Bionicle Explored video that covers some of these creatures in the description and cards. As we've already touched on Okama's search for the Gar Metro Great Disc in the previous chapter, let's move straight on to Vakama's search for his disc, which he undertakes with Onewa. This takes us to Tar Metro, where the Morbizak has taken root. The pair look for the disc in the fire pits of the district, of which we get the following description. The Tar Metru fire pits consisted of half a dozen deep, narrow craters from which spewed forth great jets of flame. A nest of underground pipelines fed the fires to wherever they were needed in the Metru. Given their importance, it was no surprise that the site was fenced off and guarded by the Norak. The other tower retrieved their great discs in what is relegated to a one minute montage in the film and reconvened to deduce that they need to destroy the king root of the Morbizak, which is located in the Great Furnace. The Matoran are not helpless burdens during this fight, though Akmu does attempt to run. Nevertheless, they form a Matoran Nui to help the tower break through to the main chamber. This is not the only time we see the Matoran essentially come to the rescue of the Toa Metru. It raises an idea that enters the thoughts of Aniwa later on in the book. His thoughts drifted back to the Great Temple, and the moment he and the others had become tower. He had certainly never imagined when he was brought the Toa Stone there that his whole life was about to change nor would he have necessarily picked his five fellow heroes of Machinui. Vakama was too much of a dreamer. Nokama seemed a little stuck on herself, Mata was simply annoying, and Nuju and Wenwa argued constantly. Still, they must have been chosen for this honour for a reason. Just as a Po Metru crafter selected the right tools for a job, so the great spirit Matanui must have had a plan in mind when he chose the six. But what it could be, Anewa had no idea. Then an awful thought struck him. What if they were not the Matoran meant to become Toa? What if there had been a mistake, an accident? What if one or more of them got Toa stones when they were not meant to do so? As evidenced by the other six Matoran's display of unity to become the Matoran Nui, these were the six originally chosen by Likan, influenced by Matanui. However, the interference of Makuta Teridax changed the course of history, and the original six were to never become Toa. As we've come to Makuta, now we come to the part of the story where answers are being sought as to who planted the Morbizak seeds in the first place. Someone who would have had access to the Great Furnace. Someone who is eluding notice of both the Matoran and the Toa. In the dark corridors of the Colosseum, all is not well. Turagaduma has been acting strangely. In actuality, about 18 months prior to the Great Cataclysm, the Makuta of Metronui Teridax had taken the guise of the trusted leader of the city while the real Duma was placed in the Matoran sphere. Having practically installed himself into the highest echelon of power in the Matoran universe, he used Duma's authority to send the rest of Lee Khan's team to their deaths, with the assistance of Dark Hunter Eliminator, as well as reprogramming the Vaki to escort the Matoran to the Colosseum. Anyone who attempted to stop them from this duty was seen as an enemy of the city. Makuta's path to power strikes a similarity to that of another infamous science fantasy villain, 
Palpatine essentially manoeuvres himself into a high political office and uses that authority to reprogram the clones to see the Jedi protectors as an enemy. A parallel could be drawn between Order 66 and Makuta's posing as Duma, directive to kill all of Mechanui's protectors, the Tor Mangai. Just an interesting observation. Makuta's plan to put the Matoran who keep the Great Spirit alive into stasis is what Lee Khan is referring to when he tells the Tor Metru that a shadow threatens its heart. It is also interesting to see how Makuta justifies what he is doing to himself. The false Turaga Duma watched the unsuspecting Matoran file in. They were so innocent. They would never be able to handle the changes that were coming. Better that they should be sheltered from it all until such time as he decided they could resume their lives again. His thoughts indicate his feeling of almost a divine right to replace Matanui, as well as how he perceives the Matoran as being so small and beneath him, easily manipulated and coerced. Even though 2004 is the fourth story year in order of release, it is still the first act of the wider legend, and is its inciting incident. Makuta's plan brings about the Great Cataclysm, and zooming out into the cosmic scale, the Great Spirit Robot falls into Aqua Magna, is what sunders the continents within the Matoran universe which it houses. We'll return to Makuta shortly, but first I want to look at the Dark Hunters he employs, specifically Nadiki. Even though Nadiki's backstory hasn't been expanded out yet, this would come later, we do get tantalising hints as to his past. Rather than being hunted down and killed during Makuta's purge of the Tower, Nadiki perhaps suffers a worse fate in the eyes of Lee Khan, having betrayed him and everything the Tower stand for in exchange for a deal with the Dark Hunter's leader, who had no intention of upholding it. Nadiki would never again be seen as a brother in the eyes of Lee Khan, who had already had to deal with the betrayal of another of his team a couple of thousands of years earlier. Stuck in a twisted spider-like form, outcast from the Tower and mistrusted by his new outfit, Nadiki's bitterness comes to the fore when he is hired out by Makuta to help enforce his plan. Moments such as the following I think are fantastic in helping us understand just how far Nadiki has fallen. Duma turned to Nadiki and Krekka, barely controlled anger in his voice. The new, new tower must, must not, not interfere with the plan. They are mere Matoran in tower armor. As is our duty, we shall not fail. I find it interesting how Nadiki still holds on to some twisted sense of duty like he tries to convince himself that he still has the values of a tower. Just one quick line, a certain word choice, and it tells us so much about the character. I could talk at length about Nadiki, but for now I want to look at his ultimate fate and how that ties into how Makuta is conveyed to us and how that affects our understanding of him as a character. I'll leave a link below to my Tower Dark Unto War video which explores a bit more of Nadiki's story, his relationship to Lee Khan, and contextualises his betrayal. While the Toa Metro is separated, with one team on the run and the other imprisoned, Makuta consolidates his power. He is essentially in complete control now. When the Toa Metro are finally able to confront him after reuniting, Makuta has no more need of his Turaga form and drops the guise. The Toa attempt to get some of the Matoran to safety through the Great Barrier, a story that is continued in the following book, Voyage of Fear, while Vakama faces off against Makuta for the Kanoe Vahi, which he has just crafted from the Great Discs. Let's take a look at how these events are presented to us in the film. Let's have a look at some of the supplementary media we got during the year of the story. Perhaps most notably, in autumn 2004, we got Bionicle 2 Legends of Machinui. I used to watch this film a lot, and so feels more nostalgic to me than Mask of Light, which I only saw in the years following. Even now, looking back at the four we got, Legends is probably the one I can sit, watch and enjoy the most. That said, there are some things about the film that don't quite work. I'll go over some of these, as well as some things which I think do work. The film follows a somewhat abbreviated version of the plot of Bionicle Adventures 4, Legends of Machinui. Much of the dialogue and scenes are lifted straight from the book, However, events from the previous books are crammed into the film, such as the aforementioned Search for the Great Discs. As the Morbizak is not part of the film's plot, the Toa Metru seemingly retrieved the discs merely to gain the favour of Turagaduma, which fails. It is only later by accident that Vakama realises he needs them to create the Mask of Time, an artefact that Makuta would very much like to get his hands on. As he absorbs the power of Metronui, channeling it into himself through the Colosseum like a conduit, the Varki, hives, other beings, everything, I don't think Makuta's raw power is showing greater than this moment. Nothing matters to him now. His need for patience, impersonating Duma, the Varki, the Dark Hunters, they are all as much as his victims as the Matoran are. His killing of the pair, despite the possible repercussions of such an act, is an effective device to show not only Makuta's power at this point, but also his mindset and what drives him. 
Now this is at the end of the day a kids film so casting an adult critical eye over it is perhaps a little unfair but some parts of Makuta's portrayal here are also a little off. There's this weird scene shortly after Makuta Duma orders the arrest of the tower and he's in his chamber while the Makuta's red pair of eyes look back at him. Duma then appears to have a conversation with Makuta even though they are one and the same at this point. The novelization of the same scene in the book doesn't really make things clearer. The mask of time is not yet completed. No. But when the great shadow falls, the Vaki will ensure every Matorian's fate. There's no mention of a reflective wall, which is, I think, the intention in the film. Even though we've seen Makuta monologue to himself before, and certainly something he would do, I don't think it quite works here. I think the filmmakers wanted a way for us to get a scene from Makuta's perspective of his plan, but it doesn't really work from that angle either, as we don't learn anything new. To a casual viewer, and certainly to 8 year old me at the time, when I understood far less about the law, this scene just makes it look like Duma is in league with Makuta, which, to anyone who knows the backstory well, is utter nonsense and something Duma would never do. If the idea was for this wall to be reflecting Makuta's true form, mirroring his disguise as Duma, then I can see the merit in that idea, but I just don't think it quite lands here. Unless Makuta taking the form of Duma for so long has caused him to take on some of the real Duma's personality, but that's a whole other rabbit hole I won't get into. I think in general these little scenes either hinting or telling us that a malevolent force is posing as Duma are unnecessary and just having his reveal at the Colosseum would suffice as a twist in my view. That aside, I do think this is overall more enjoyable than A Mask of Light and lacks any truly annoying moments. Nathan First does an excellent job with the score, most notably Lee Khan's track, which I think probably captures my childhood more than any other piece of Bionicle music. Those notes evoke a certain underlying sadness which makes sense given Lee Khan's backstory and isn't some incredibly upbeat, rip-roaring rock track. I also think Doom as voice actor especially does a good job at giving an authoritative, commanding tone to the character, and even though he's not the real Doomer, you can still hear the echoes of wisdom and experience there. One more quick observation on the film, during Vakama's confrontation with Makuta, he says the following line. Join my brothers and me. Another line in this film that puzzled the eight-year-old me. Now I would probably take that to mean the Brotherhood of Makuta, which if true means that, if not the whole, at least the seeds of the idea were there as early as 2004. How do you interpret this line? What do you make of it? Let me know in the comments. In addition to the feature film, there was a number of bonus material included on the DVD which I used to watch over and over again. Any bit of extra information on this world I just wanted to find out more of and absorb. This included interviews, storyboards, and notably the Machinui Explorer, quick featurettes about certain things in the film, be it locations or characters. This was also carried over to the bonus features of Web of Shadows. In Legends, they are narrated by Nuju, giving an in-character overview of different aspects of Machinui. Although they are very short, it's a nice feature that adds to the world building and any excuse to hear Lee Khan's theme, which plays over the clips, is more than welcome. There's also a 10 minute documentary about the making of the film which is presented in an accessible way for kids to show them a glimpse of the technical side of the process of filmmaking. As I remember being interested in this as an 8 to 9 year old, it clearly worked and they even talk about some scenes that were planned but ultimately never included into the finished film, such as a scene where a Lorak attacks Lee Khan. These interviews serve as a nostalgic time capsule now, as at the time the documentary was clearly recorded, the 2005 sets were being designed, and we get a glimpse of some of this in the featurette. There's so much more that could be mentioned, there are of course the comics, but I feel like I've covered the main points I wanted to articulate about the 2004 story. We've dived into the books, the film and the characters in a way I hope has communicated why this particular year, oft overlooked I feel, captures the essence of my love for Bionicle more than any other year. Until next time, thank you for watching, and see you in the next one.